reported acute numerous symptoms of toxic chemical exposure. There's credible detections of chemical warfare agents made by Czech, French, and American forces. Chemical warfare agents that were detected by coalition forces during the Gulf War include the nerve agent Tabin, sarin, cyclosarin, and the blister agents sulfur, mustard, and lewisite. To this date, there has been no diagnosis or treatment offered by the Department of Defense or Veterans Administration. Dr. Robert Haley, MD of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas, has detected damage in the brains of those Gulf War veterans who were near the explosion of Camasilla. Those injuries had resulted in not only increased social problems, but also a 90% divorce rate and increased crime rates among those vets who showed damage in the area of the brain that controls judgment. The children of Gulf War veterans have shown increased defects such as Golden Heart Syndrome, a missing eye or ear, major organ or digestive deformities, and general failure to thrive. Thirteen years after the Gulf War, the Department of Defense still calls the Gulf War illness a mystery disease. Either the Pentagon employs the most incompetent researchers and physicians in the world or the cover-up is by design that these troops are being denied meaningful medical care. We can only conclude that the Department of Defense is waiting for an army to die. The threat of biological warfare is nothing new to the military, but the Persian Gulf War placed a special emphasis on it. This renewed emphasis caused the Defense Department to look at how it was protecting men and women in uniform from this battlefield threat, this unseen enemy. Staff Sergeant Noah Berg looks at one of those enemies and what is being done to fight it. The Defense Department says it can be a big threat on the modern battlefield. Anthrax, most commonly associated with livestock. And the type that worries those military leaders most is the type that is inhaled. Sometimes people refer to it as very early stages as something like a common cold. But then uh, it goes, the person goes downhill very quickly. Because of the potential anthrax threat, last year the Defense Department ordered vaccinations. And one of the first in line was Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Eric Benkin. Despite isolated protests, the vast majority of medical experts endorsed the vaccine's use. And despite charges that the so-called Gulf War syndrome and anthrax are connected, Hutzel says that's just not true. The Defense Department continues to stress the safety of the anthrax vaccine, and all troops headed for the Persian Gulf receive the inoculation series. We had all the problems from immunizations. Our team was tasked with to put together the anthrax vaccine program in theater. But we were also ordered do not record lots, batches, doses, who got them, what their reactions were, when they got them, or how many they got. Direct orders. There's enough paperwork right now to prove there is a Gulf War illness, and there's certain medicines that control it, and that's all they're doing right now is controlling it for a few. Staff Sergeant Mark Zeller was a member of Special Operations in the 18th Airborne Corps. He served in the Iraq-Iran War, Desert Shield, and Desert Storm campaign. And we're all forced to uh, roll up our sleeves and pull down our pants and get shots in the gluteus and in the uh, tricep muscles of our arms. We, we all started getting sick, and, and, uh, but we didn't think nothing of it because our flight surgeon was telling us that it's hygiene that's getting us. We're all not taking baths every day. It's like maybe once a week or once every three days. And uh, that hygiene was supposedly getting the best of us, so we didn't think anything of it after that. And they punched us with all these different vaccines, uh, you know, supposedly to protect us. And knowing that, you know, some of these had never been tested uh, on humans. My neck bones are degenerating. My lower back's degenerating. No one knows why. They want to go in there and scrape it and biopsy it. I'm like, 
I don't want to be in a wheelchair afterwards. Pretty, uh, it's pretty damaging to a guy that used to be in special operations and jumped out of airplanes for a living. So. The use of vaccines in the military with recruits and servicemen and women is well documented. What is not well known is the relationship between the Department of Defense and pharmaceutical companies who have a vested interest in the widespread use of vaccines. What is contained in the vaccines and just how many of those vaccines that were given that were in fact experimental. The experimentation of individual military members by the bureaucracy of the military medical establishment crosses all party lines. Military experimental use of vaccines have been conducted during the past 50 years. The senior Bush administration ordered the use of experimental vaccines, anthrax and botulinum during the buildup of the first Gulf War. The Clinton administration ordered the experimental use of the tick-borne encephalitis vaccine in Bosnia. Perhaps one of the most devastating executive orders regarding vaccines came under the Clinton administration. Executive Order 13139 essentially orders the use of experimental vaccines and or drugs at any time without the service member's consent to be given to anyone in the military as long as the President or the Secretary of Defense approves. During the first Gulf War, it was not unusual for a service member ordered to Iraq in 1991 to receive 10 to 17 vaccines in one setting. Thousands of U.S. and coalition military personnel who served in the Persian Gulf War are now seriously incapacitated from unknown causes. One common thread for all military personnel were the vaccines. Many of those who did not deploy became ill also. Unfortunately, the U.S. military medical establishment has continued to conduct on an ongoing basis operations such as Project Badger and that that has been referred to as a Manhattan-like project that involved the Tri-Service Vaccine Task Force. Credit for the best vaccine research should go to Gary Matsumoto in his acclaimed book entitled Vaccine A. Matsumoto concludes that the government covertly experimented on troops using squalene, which is an oil-based booster used to make vaccines stronger. Squalene has only been approved for use in experimental AIDS and experimental malaria vaccines. Since a large percentage of U.S. forces tested positive for squalene, it has led many individuals to believe that the anthrax vaccine could have been a primary clinical trial for an AIDS vaccine experiment. What the DOD should have disclosed to the troops is that squalene causes life-threatening diseases such as lupus, crippling arthritis, and multiple sclerosis. On May 11, 1999, at an Air Force briefing held at Dover Air Force Base, Air Force Surgeon General Charles H. Rodman II denied the use of squalene in the anthrax vaccine. He was backed up by Army Colonel Arthur Friedlander. However, six weeks later, the FDA identified the presence of squalene in two separate vaccine lots. With the reintroduction of the anthrax vaccine prior to the Second Gulf War, up to 50% of Air National Guard pilots resigned rather than take the deadly vaccine. To this date, the Department of Defense continues to give the anthrax vaccine to U.S. military. walk into a recruiter's office, the first thing they say is, young man, if you do this, you'll be taken care of forever. And in modern day, the 2021st century soldier, it includes women. So men and women are promised health care should they become sick from the battlefield. And the fact of the matter is, is that since Operation Desert Storm concluded, 10 to 11,000 soldiers are dead. A quarter of a million of us get a check from the veteran.